Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, my name is Lee Javaharian. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, here we have a uh, box in a room. It's a virtual box in a virtual room. Um, let's bring this box into the physical world. Okay. In my hand, I have a box. Anything could be inside this box. Any secret. Uh, there could be a cat in the box, a small cat. Could be a Cheshire cat, it could be a Persian cat, there could be a Schrodinger cat, there could be a rat in the box. Um, let's see what's in the box. Um, let's kick box. The box opens. Inside the box is another box. Um, it's an electronic box. Inside every box is a secret. And that secret is another box with another secret. The, um, the world is that way. Uh, there is actually no secret. It's just a zero or a one, a this or a that. Um, the actual secret is the journey. It's the journey of the roguelike. What most of us think of as computation is a black box. We think of it as something that you input. Uh, it you know, processes the information, transforms it, and it provides an output. Um, but there's another way to think about computation. Um, if you're inside the box, it looks very different. It looks like pattern and movement. The roguelike is a journey of computation, an abstraction of a dualistic universe. The adventurer and the place to adventure, the halls, the rooms, a giant fractal tree of information expression. When I was uh, 10 years old, um, the second computer game that I ever played was called Eamon, Eamon Adventure by Donald Brown. And it showed me, in one fell swoop, uh, the, the concept of interactive fiction and the roguelike, um, both of these elements. When I was about 10 to 12 years old, I lived through what I call the golden age of electronic RPGs. Um, of course, there's Rogue, you know, and that was on the Unix systems. But I was 10 at the time. I didn't discover Unix until my 20s. But, so I grew up with the microcomputer. And there are games like Eamon, uh, Richard Garriott's Akalabeth, and Ultima, the dungeons. They had a roguelike element. There was a, a Dark Tower electronic board game, um, uh, Tunnels of Doom, another type of dungeon. Uh, yeah. And then there were handheld games. Um, so I played all of these games, and then um, after 1982, there was a video game crash of 1983. Um, and what that meant was that there wasn't a lot of um, importance. Well, companies um, didn't see any value in small machines or uh, re machines with limited resources. So everything went to the powerful microcomputer. And I learned all about it, and I wanted to see what the microcomputer was capable of. Um, so. I started studying, you know, microcomputers, and the Commodore 64, for example, was an 8-bit computer at the time, and I learned all about it, and I really liked the Commodore. I mean, I really liked the Commodore. <clears throat> so I built this, and this is a, it's a PBX system based on a Commodore 64. IBM uh, PCs were out at the time, but I liked the minimalistic um, experience. I actually had to expand it. Um, using the, the user port didn't have as many uh, GPO or input output lines, so I had to create addressable lines using the cartridge port. It's actually a mini telephone network. And so um, I went into IT and became a system administrator. Um, but then I started, uh, just recently, I started getting back into m these minimalistic computing. And I, the Raspberry Pi had come out, and I decided to m create a web, a web server on it. And I decided that I was going to build a generator. Um, and what it is is a, it's a static site generator. It pre-computes the, you know, the website, pre-computes a wiki, and it transforms it from the time domain to space domain so these little Raspberry Pis can run it. So I thought, well, can I do the same with a roguelike? <laughs> can I get a roguelike into this? And you can, um, but you've got to do the generator. You, you know, you pre-compute it. And everyone here is familiar with generator. That's you know, procedural generation, which lines up really well with the roguelike. So why did I do that? Um, let's go back to the 80s. OK. The Eamon Town showed me what the MMORPG was all about. Um, if you look at 1980, um, you have a weapon shop. 
you have a class trainer and you have a banker, um, that's modern MMORPG. Uh, and then there's combat, and it's non-modal, but it's text-based. So you fight in the same mode as the mode that you're you know, adventuring in. Very roguelike. And they had stats, three stats. First time I've ever heard what charisma was. Uh, it was all text-based, text-based parser, so there was no um, overhead map, so it doesn't you know, fit the Berlin interpretation, but underlying, it was spatial. Then, the same year, uh, Gary came out with um, Akalabeth, and the dungeons, they had permadeath, but they also, um, he used the first person's perspective. And there actually are no rooms. Uh, when you go to, through a, a doorway, it takes you to another hall, um, but there are objects in these halls. Um, and he also had non-modal combat. There's a rat. You're fighting a rat. Dark Tower uh, was an electronic board game. Um, it had some roguelike elements, but it showed you that the co computation could be done on a microprocessor and the board could be cardboard. And Tunnels of Doom, of course, it repeated the same type of first-person perspective that Garriott used. But it had a different type of combat. Uh, for example, this is uh, a room where you're fighting a rat. You enter the room, and then it takes you to a modal combat screen. Um, so this is not the Berlin interpretation of a roguelike, but it has roguelike elements. But here's an overhead map, so they're, they're trying to do it. And there's a general store. And here's that device I mentioned. Uh, it's a calculator on one side, but it's another secret box. Um, there's a little slider on it. And if you slide it, you get a dungeon. It's actually an ancient village. And there's a ghost of the ancient wizard that exists in some of those little secret, smaller buildings there. And it has combat. It's not exactly a roguelike, but it shows you that people at that time were trying to build uh, games on small devices like that. So the roguelike core exists in many of these early games. Um, and of course, Rogue used ASCII, but Eamon used ASCII to narrate instead of narrating it using, or instead of using symbols. Uh, you know, Alakabeth and Tunnels of Doom were first person, um, and then Dark Tower and Chase Encounter, that was an um, electronic game. So, why did I use a microcontroller? The reason I wanted to do that was because the limitations of the early hardware um, actually added mystique to the games. If you, when you're playing those games, the uh, rooms are drawn very slowly. You have a lot of time to think. You have a lot of time to look at empty doors. Um, just experiencing the unknown, uh, pausing you know, uh, unit by unit as you move through the, the dungeon, it's, it's fascinating. Um, it's also a physical object. You know, that little microcontroller um, is a physical object that ties you to the world. It's not just a piece of software. You can actually see it self-contained in front of you. Um, it also has a hidden binary. So it's like a, a magical box. And it's an ideal magical box. Um, it can store any secret inside it. Uh, and there's also, you know, the concept of permadeath in a normal roguelike is, uh, can be extended to perma end of world, where the chip actually can deactivate itself. Um, now, that would seem like a ridiculous idea, but these devices are, are so inexpensive, you could actually build perma end of world roguelikes. And they're very cheap. So why did I use, use an AVR? Uh, it's well supported by the open source GCC compiler. And the Arduino, uh, which actually uses an AVR, um, is very popular. And it means that there's a lot of people um, putting out information about the AVR chips themselves. I chose the ATtiny 1634. Um, and the, the main reason was 16 megabytes flash. That's actually a lot for those small devices. Um, but it also includes an extremely low power mode called Pico Power, and I'll tell you about that later. And it has a hardware UART. Well, that's very important for communicating with the chip, especially if you're going to do an ASCII type of roguelike. And it's also interesting that the same lines you use to program are also the lines it uses to communicate. So that means that you can create a development environment where you can program the chip, 
and then immediately start communicating with it. Um, there's capacitive touch abilities, but those are kind of hard to use. They use additional power. I, I chose not to use that. And it's very inexpensive. $2 for the chip, then you can use a $20 Raspberry Pi to program it. And that's the, all you need. And this is a um, schematic of the chip. Now, on the upper right, you can see the actual um, UART lines that are lined up with the um, ISP lines of the chip. OK, so <laughs> this is the interesting part. A modern PC actually has 8 million times the RAM of this device. I mean, think about it, 8 million K of RAM. Uh, the AT Tiny has 1K. Um, so you start thinking it's just about impossible. And by the way, this is an approximation in decimal. It's not, um, you know, 1024 KB. But uh, it seems impossible at first. But then when you look at what the early 8-bit programmers were doing, you know, they still had more resources. They were doing some interesting things. But the Atari 2600, back in 1977, had one-eighth the resources of that chip, and they were still able to make fascinating games. So it can be done, it's just, how do you do it? So the first thing I did was uh, built a development environment. This was a little bit difficult. Uh, I decided to go with Arch Linux, and I used the AVR uh, GCC suite. Um, I also had to do some interesting things uh, to get it to work. Um, once you go through some of the um, things on this page which show you how to connect Arch Linux um, to the unit, you actually have to uh, uh, connect the AVR in a certain way. Um, you have to use its uh, UART lines uh, as the programming lines, make, uh, and that's so you can communicate with the chip immediately after programming it. Um, and you can actually connect it directly. You don't need any resistors. Um, everything's 3.3 volt logic, so that's really interesting. So the hard part is getting AVR Dude, which is the programmer that's used to program the chip, to work correctly with that chip. Um, you actually have to recompile it um, to enable what's called bitbang programming. Um, and that actually allows you to program the chip directly from the GPIO interface in the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the other things are um, you have to you know, edit a conf file. And there's actually a bug you have to work around. Um, uh, flash memory error with that chip and that particular version of AVR Dude. Um, once you work around that, um, then the actual programmer leaves the UART pins in a state where they don't operate as a UART anymore. So what you have to do is uh, use wiring pi to return the function of those pins back to the UART alt zero mode. And then you can immediately start seeing the output of the chip. So here's the actual connection, direct connection to the chip. The power is extremely low. Um, even running at 8 megahertz, the power is low. And you could connect a watch battery, um, which actually would last 36 years in some of the uh, um, low power modes. And the interesting thing is you can set the chip into these uh, sleep modes and then use interrupt programming to activate it, which is ideal for a roguelike because roguelikes are turn-based. And so you power it down. Um, when no, there's another turn, you power the chip up, do the turn, power it down. Well, what if we use the sun? Not fusion, you know. I'm talking about solar. Um, also in the 80s, there were things like this. This is my calculator. It's one of mm, three calculators. But it's, I still use it today, and it's very reliable. And there are all kinds of companies actually making games um, that were uh, battery operated or solar. And it can be done. You just uh, connect a solar panel to it. And the reason it can be done is because um, the current draw is so low. And indoor lighting can actually produce enough current. The data retention of the device, this is interesting, is 100 years. And the solar cell itself might last 50 years. So you could think of the chip as a self you know, a solid state um, uh, device that's almost like a physical board game. You could, you could store it away. You could get it out every year, play it, store it away. You could do that for 50 to 100 years. <laughs> so it has a very physical um, element to it. The EEPROM is only 256 bytes, and it's barely large enough to store the actual game 
in case of power failure. Now, the chip has brownout detection, which means that if you do lose light, for example, um, it will deactivate itself so it doesn't corrupt the RAM. And C language is pretty much required for this type of device. Um, that means no objects. <laughs> so interpreted languages don't work, and assembly is if you are an Atari 2600 programmer. Um, now, you're going to have to build a user interface directly on this. So you can create a dedicated UI, which I did. Um, you can create a physical game board, which I did. Um, I also, you could actually connect this to NTSC Composite. Some people have actually built circuits that do this. Or you could turn it into a UART server and play like a traditional roguelike. The, the important thing that you need to do is uh, come up with a numeral system. Uh, information, you know, can be represented in a variety of ways. And if you pick the correct positional numeral system, you can um, um, create an interface that fits your game board. Um, and, you know, there's simple algorithms to do this. Um, ancient Sumerians, for example, used Base60. You know, everyone in this room probably you know, knows what I'm talking about. But I decided to use International Morse Code, which is <laughs> it's Base26. Um, and, you know, if you do 0 through 25, you can actually have a numerical representation as well. Um, timing's difficult to uh, interpret and, and uh, recognize. And sound is important if you ever use Morse code, because if you try to interpret Morse by looking at blinks, it's, it's a lot more difficult than hearing the actual dits and dahs. And sometimes Morse can actually mimic the actual action, like H to hit a creature, for example, in a game. H in Morse is dit, 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 and that's almost like pounding your fist. <laughs> so there's an interesting correlation. And frequent commands can use something like, I call it NEAT, uh, north, east, uh, south, and west. And notice that they're symmetric. You know, there's a da dit north, and a dit da south, and a dit east, and a da west. That's interesting. The N and E line up perfectly, the A and T don't. <laughs> So what I did was I created a lookup table, and there's a row and a column. Uh, the row um, on the, the left um, and the column on the right corresponds to a cell. And so you enter these pairs, and then it tells you, you know, what the word is. Well, there's a blank column, T, on the right. Those are actually hidden items and hidden creatures in the game. And when you first encounter them, it unlocks them, and so you can actually spell them. So there's all these secrets in the chip. And that's a little Morse key I created out of a micro switch. So the map, 1K isn't enough to store a map. So procedurally generating a map can not easily be done on the chip. So you know, just a 32 by 32 grid of 8-bit <laughs> variables consumes all available RAM. So you have to do it on a generator and store the map in program space, um, which is on these type of devices. It's a Harvard architecture device. Um, is like a type of ROM or Flash. So you can do that, and the levels must be kept, um, you know, to a small size, uh, large and shallow or small and deep, due to the low RAM and ROM. Um, what's interesting is you can create a huge monster item pool and then procedurally, of course, generate the instance that you're going to put on that particular chip. This was my first design, and um, I just decided to create a grid, create a Morse keyer, create an LED to um, blink back the Morse. Then I decided, you know, this is ridiculous. You know, let's go to tiles. So <laughs> it's much more space efficient, and it's actually kind of interesting because then the tiles can move around. Um, so there's a, there's the ground, there's the walls, the doors, and there's a rat. And of course. <laughs> You just draw the rat in. So you can also play uh, as a UART server. And UART is just basic serial. Um, I'm sure most people here know what it is. Um, but you can also, you know, if you're just outputting serial from your game, you also need to refresh the screen. It would be nice to move the cursor around, like an incursus type of thing. And you can do that with ANSI escape codes if you need to. Um, printf, I found, was too big uh, to use on the AVR. It used too much memory. So talking to the UART directly uh, by sending bytes to the register is a good way to do it. And here's an example. 
That's a terminal showing the, um, that's actually Minicom at 9600 baud, um, and it does screen refreshes. And that's ASCII. Okay, so interesting thing with these chips is you can leverage the intelligence of the chip. When you design the circuit, the chip itself um, is smart, so the circuit doesn't need to be as complex. And there's interesting things you can do because these chips, you're almost like you're programming the circuit in the chip. It's not a you know, FPGA or anything, but it's still very modifiable. You can change the input, output, tri-state, and pull up states of the pins, which allow you to do various things. Like you can create uh, ridiculous keyboards. Um, you can overlap circuits, and then by pulsing or scanning these ports, doing interesting things, you can actually read data, output data, without blowing your circuitry, if you're careful. So I built a proof of concept. It uses around 11K. It's just an engine. Um, there's only 5K left. There's no balanced gameplay. And I'm glad balanced gameplay isn't important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 5K, I'm hoping to get that last bit of balance. Um, and the way I designed it was I used uh, C-struct bit fields. So C-structs were ideal. But those bit fields were really interesting because I needed every bit. Um, I used the list method, you know, by storing my monsters and items in these lookup lists. But I found out that they, that was getting too big for, I was overriding all the 1K of RAM. So what I had to do was split them into um, uh, dynamic ones, which use the 1K of RAM, and then putting some in program space and splitting some of these lists into ROM. Um, makes it a little complicated. And then I used half-byte arrays for my maps, you know, uh, 16 possible tiles. Um, and I avoided using pointers. Pointers were, you know, kind of not very space efficient. I used ragged one-dimensional arrays. Um, I had to create a queuing system because when you're dealing with Morse, um, the messages are always coming in and, and you're getting overloaded with messages at you know, one, one bit data rate. <laughs> and uh, so there's a way I had to flag which messages were important and which weren't. And then the Morse decoder takes up space. I created simple success-fail responses. And it's interesting, you can make it both blind and deaf playable if you do it right. So just like that closed box, before you open it, anything is possible. Anything can be in that box. Um, one last thing I'd like to say is that back in 1980, when I was working with Eamon, I was also programming a TRS-80 computer, my first computer programming in school. And I was making simple animations. And one of the animations I was uh, making was um, a Cheshire cat. And I thought it was really interesting. I'd have the, in ASCII, I'd have the cat's face. The cat's face would disappear and it'd leave its smile. And then there was another uh, person in the class who was making an entire game. And he could move uh, uh, a player around in you know, a Cartesian space. And I couldn't believe how he did it. And so he let me look at his source code. And I was looking at how he was using loops and just incrementing x and y variables. And I, it changed my whole uh, way of programming. I wasn't thinking in terms of loops. And that person, interestingly, is now a computing professor at this university today. So that's, that was just very interesting. Anyway, after the um, presentation, I'm going to upload the PDF and some more information to this link. But until then, there, won't, it, there will be not much up there. Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, you haven't played it. <laughs> It's, it's, it's actually very, very fun because... Um, could you repeat the, the comment and then... Okay. Um, you said that you, know, you actually really like the use of Morse code as the input device. Um, it's actually um, very fun to play it in that, that manner. I tried using multiple arrangements of buttons and switches. I tried creating symmetric and asymmetric input-output types of interfaces, but just a symmetrical Morse in, Morse out. Uh, there's a fascination in doing that, and you'll learn Morse really quickly. Yeah. OK, uh, an LCD display was recommended uh, that I could use for my next project. Um,
The reason I went with this was I was going with the lowest power, the simplest arrangement possible. I wanted to see what was the simplest. Actually, I went with an, it's actually a two milliamp LED, and the, the piezo device is probably around the same milliamp. Piezos are interesting devices in that uh, the electrical characteristics change depending on the frequency. Um, it's a capacitive device. It's, uh, uh, and then I wanted to make it solar as well. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.